The 1906 Nobel Prize ceremony was the scene of one of the most embarrassing moments in the history of science. The winners, Maxim Gorky and Alex Cajal, were sharing the highest honor, but everyone in the audience knew that they were sworn academic rivals. They were honored for the same research, but provided opposing answers to a fundamental question in that field. At the heart of this ongoing debate is the physical form of human thought. What exactly are our brains composed of? In the 19th century, the cell theory was the cornerstone of biology, but the brain seemed to be the only exception. Under the microscope, we saw not clear cells, but a chaotic, tangled forest of fibers. In 1873, Golgi accidentally discovered in his simple kitchen laboratory that he could dye neurons black by soaking them in dichromate and then treating them with silver nitrate. Under the microscope, they resembled dark corals. Golgi gazed at these isolated corals, yet he believed they were only the tip of the iceberg. To him, the transmission of thought was as swift as lightning, allowing no interruption. In the darkness, invisible threads must connect all cells into a vast, continuous neural network. Unfortunately, the Golgi staining method was unstable and received mediocre reviews. He was frustrated by this. Although he discovered the Golgi apparatus with this method, he left the sad field of neuroscience. Fortunately, 15 years later, another genius picked up this dusty sword again. Cajal a passionate Spanish artist and scientist from the academic fringe, was reportedly drawn to histology because the research was affordable, requiring only a simple microscope, which perfectly suited his limited income. He improved Golgi's staining method, then locked himself in his lab, sketching everything under the microscope daily, leaving over three, zero, zero, zero hand-drawn brain images whose detail and accuracy rivaled electronic images a century later. During this work, he discovered a crucial detail. There's a tiny gap between neurons. The axon terminal of one neuron is always infinitely close to the dendrite of the next neuron but never truly fuses. Based on this gap and other indirect evidence, Cajal proposed the neuron theory. The brain is not a network, but a vast community of billions of independent cells. Sparks of thought must cross the gaps between cells, completing relay after relay. Thus, the opening scene occurs. Gorky did not elaborate on his research at the Nobel Prize podium, but instead criticized Cajal defending his intricate network. Cajal politely countered, suggesting that assuming the nervous system is a continuous network seems simple and convenient. Unfortunately, nature doesn't care about our preference for convenience and uniformity. It inherently favors complexity and diversity. Half a century later, the invention of the electron microscope made the synapse gap clearly visible. Cajal had one, and we finally discovered the atom of thought, the neuron. However, the end of one war is only the beginning of another. Since neurons are independent, how do they communicate with each other? How do the sparks of thought cross the chasm called synapsis? A new debate has broken out, and the two sides have been jokingly called the spark faction and the soup faction. The spark school believed nerve signals, like electric sparks, could jump across gaps. They saw the nervous system as biological wires, explaining rapid nerve reactions. This became mainstream. However, the soup school asked why, if it was just electric current, stimulating different nerves would have opposite effects on the same organ. They speculated that some chemical released at the nerve endings must diffuse like seasoning in a thick soup, telling the next cell what to do. The key piece of evidence in this debate came from a near apocalyptic dream. On Easter Eve 1921, pharmacologist Otto Lowy dreamt a perfect experiment. He woke, scribbled it down, but his handwriting was illegible and the dream forgotten by morning. He fretted all day. Miraculously, the same dream returned the next night. This time, Levi didn't hesitate and rushed to the lab. He removed two live frog hearts and placed them in containers. He used an electric current to stimulate the vagus nerve of the first heart, slowing its heartbeat. He then siphoned some of the broth into a second, completely separate container. The second heart also slowed down, 
proving that the nerve endings were indeed releasing some chemical into the broth, transmitting the command to slow down. Levi had discovered the messenger between neurons, the neurotransmitter. He later thanked himself for not being fully alert in the night. If it had been daytime, he would have abandoned the experiment out of concern for the minuscule concentration of transmitters. He also had to be thankful it was an Easter dream. If it had been a midsummer night, these fragile chemical messengers would have been destroyed by the heat. Humanity's understanding of the brain might be delayed for decades. However, the Spark School was not completely defeated. In the 1950s, they discovered electrical synapses. These gaps are three nanometers, allowing neurons rapid transmission. Even so, this accounts for only a small fraction of neurons, and communication is mainly through chemical signals. After deciphering neuron relationships, another question arises. Since it is a chemical soup that carries the message across the gap, then what exactly gives the command inside the neuron to release those transmitters? If we revisit Lowy's classic experiment, we find a relay, first an electrical signal, then a chemical one. And now, what we must uncover is the very spark of electricity that pulls the trigger. In 1939, Hodgkin and Huxley found an ideal specimen, the giant squid. This creature has an axon nearly one millimeter in diameter, allowing scientists to insert microelectrodes. Neurons' electrical signals, action potentials, follow an all or nothing principle. No half-hearted signals, only clear yes or no statements. This binary language, through different firing frequencies and patterns, forms the basis of complex information in our brains. And when countless neurons begin communicating in this language, something even more advanced happens. Psychologists have proposed that neurons that fire together wire together. This means that when two neurons fire in sync repeatedly, the synaptic connection between them strengthens. Just like how a road is formed when more people walk on it, our memories, habits, and even personality may be a unique neural network in our brains formed by billions of such tron paths. This idea explains the biological basis of intelligence and laid the groundwork for the explosion of artificial intelligence half a century later. The design logic of today's deep learning models, which can recognize images, translate languages, and create works, traces back to Hebb's law. Ultimately, by understanding our brains, we've created a silicon-based bionic brain. Reflecting on this century-long journey, we've pursued the origins of thinking, only to discover that the path mirrors the source itself. In this jungle of accidental connections and false signals, generations of scientists use their paranoia, inspiration, and courage to try and fail in chaos, ultimately finding the path known as Hebb's Law. Countless accidental flashes of thought have been precipitated into solid, profound avenues in the network of human knowledge. This road, and we who walk on it, are the greatest miracle of thought itself.